nearly six years of bitter conflict, a Nazi Germany, beaten to her knees at her own game of war, gives up the struggle. In a marquee tent, which represents 21st Army Group Advance Headquarters, Field Marshal Montgomery accepts the unconditional surrender of those enemy formations opposing his forces. This to include all naval ships in these areas. These forces to lay down their arms and to surrender unconditionally. The German command to carry out at once and without argument or comment, all further orders that will be issued by the Allied powers on any subject. The German delegation will now sign this uh, this paper, and uh, 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 they will sign in order of seniority, and uh, General Admiral von Friedeberg uh, will uh, sign first. <coughs> one by one, the representatives of a beaten mob of gangsters sign the terms which put their hordes completely in the hands of the conquerors. The day of ambition's fulfillment has arrived for the great tactician Field Marshal Montgomery and his comrades in arms. The triumphal note which was first sounded on the sands of North Africa has swelled to a mighty crescendo of victory resounding around the world. Now I will sign the instrument on behalf of the Supreme Allied Commander, General Eisenhower. The mighty German mechanized army collapses. Now it's not so mighty and not so mechanized. To establish communication between the Allies and the surrendered army, German signalmen lay cable toward Canadian lines. Here they meet a line section of Royal Canadian signals. Both groups work together to complete the link-up. Soon disposal orders flow through to German commanders from Montgomery's headquarters. Following the enemy's capitulation, a conference is held in which Allied sub-commanders instruct their opposite numbers on the German side in the procedure to be observed in making the surrender. On a Canadian front, General Blaskowitz and his officers receive instructions from General Fuchs and his staff of the 1st Canadian Corps. Commanders who faced each other a few hours ago across the battlefield now meet face to face across the conference table. Disgruntled and beaten, arrogant Nazi generals are dispatched to carry out the bidding of the Allied High Command. The organization works smoothly. Under Allied supervision, the disorder of the defeated German army resolves itself into orderly surrender. Warlike gear, which once terrorized a stricken Europe, will now be forged into tools of peace for German hands to rebuild countries shattered by their fury. In the center of empire, with hearts beating high with pride and joy, crowds in their millions await the official word that victory has been won in the West. Britons from the dominions, the colonies, and the homeland, with guests from occupied countries, stand in hushed expectancy, eagerly awaiting the pronouncement of Britain's Prime Minister. Yesterday morning, at 2.41 a.m., at General Eisenhower's headquarters, General Jodl, the representative of the German High Command, and of Grand Admiral Dönitz, the designated head of the German state, signed the act of unconditional surrender of all German land, sea, and air forces in Europe to the Allied Expeditionary Forces and simultaneously to the Soviet High Command. Uh, hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight, Tuesday the 8th of May. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing.
Today is victory in Europe day. Long live the cause of freedom. God save the king. Forgotten for the moment are the grim years of sweat, blood and tears. As in scenes of mad abandon, London celebrates the long-awaited V-Day. The disastrous months of 1940 are far, far away. The horrors of threatened invasion and blitz bombing are mere specters of the past. Shoulder to shoulder, civilians, workmen, housewives and service people of the far-flung empire have made this day possible. They have the right to celebrate. They wear the mantle of victory. Before Buckingham Palace, excitement reaches fever heat as the moment arrives when the royal family makes an appearance. For a glimpse of their beloved monarch in his hour of triumph, loyal subjects have stood for hour after hour. Now their wishes are fulfilled. Now they celebrate together the great day of triumph. Give thanks to God for a great deliverance. In the Far East, we have yet to deal with the Japanese, a determined and cruel foe. But to this we shall turn with the utmost resolve and with all our resources. But at this hour, when the dreadful shadow of war has passed far from our hearths and homes in these islands, we may at last make one pause for thanksgiving. First, and let us remember those who will not come back, their constancy and courage in battle, their sacrifice and endurance in the face of a merciless enemy. We have come to the end of our tribulation, and they are not with us at the moment of our rejoicing. The day is one of thanksgiving the world over. In Holland, there is real cause to cheer. The capitulation of Germany has literally saved thousands from death by starvation. Their Canadian liberators are fated and ceremonies of thanks are held for delivery. General Quirar addresses his first Canadian army. Victory day, at long last, has arrived. The business we Canadians came over here to do is virtually finished. The military might of Hitler's Germany is a horror of the past. And in this prolonged and bitter struggle, now crowned with victory, the Army of Canada has played a sterling part. Canadians are entitled to be very proud of their soldiers. I am certainly proud beyond words to count myself one of them. We have reached the time when the great and gallant company, which has formed the first Canadian army, is about to dissolve by groups and by units, with anticipation and joy in their hearts, tempered by the memories of the friends they have lost. The Canadians who have survived will be returning home to Canada. I believe that the future of Canada rests in their hands. It will be a grand future, should they be given the opportunity in peace to prove and practice the admirable characteristics they have demonstrated in war. Back in London, VE Day draws to a close, but the celebrations still go on. Not in one day alone can all the pent-up joy be released. The world has been saved from the clutches of one oppressor. Now we turn to smash the other, thus joining peace to victory, a peace which will last a thousand years. <laughs>